Welcome to our gathered time of worship. As we prepare our hearts for worship, we might find ourselves having a hard time this morning considering the latest instances of injustice. Uh, it is a hard time in our country. Uh, for the past few weeks, America has been vividly exposed to tragic deaths and murders of our brothers and sisters. And it is only appropriate for us to grieve, to be angry, and to cry out for God's justice to intervene. So let us do so by doing what we can this morning. Let's turn to God. Let us find refuge in God and worship. And that is the call to worship for this morning. It comes from Psalm 73. The psalmist confesses that we may become weary in our hearts and our flesh and our heart may fail, but our confession is that God is the strength of our hearts and our portion forever. In God's goodness, we can take refuge. In the reflection of his justice, we can find peace knowing that he will see things through. So let us rest in his holiness, in his strength. Let us turn our eyes to God and meditate on who he is. I will read and you can respond. Let us rise and receive this call to worship. Truly, God is good to Israel to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Let's pray. O oh, holy God, we come to you in such time of desperation and in such time of need of you, Lord. Our hearts have been growing weary, Lord. Our flesh fainted as we witnessed a destruction, violations of your image and your holiness. God, but it is good to be near you, Lord, because you are the strength of our hearts and our portion forever. That is our confession, Lord, although we may not feel so this morning because we have been made you, oh God, our refuge. We have no one to turn to but only you for such justice. O oh, gracious Father, kindly guide us with your counsel. Let us be discerned to your end. Let us come into your sanctuary and worship you. We ask that you will renew our hearts this morning and our worship of you. Lord, be lifted up and reign in us. We thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's praise God together. As we sing these songs together, just as we've heard, let's uh, again reflect on God's love, reflect on our call as God's people uh, to love those who are facing injustice, uh, specifically our, our black brothers and sisters, that we will respond in love, in wisdom, in his truth, thinking through how Jesus responded to injustice and ultimately supporting our brothers and sisters, the, the African-American community through this time 
in whatever way we can, that we would demonstrate God's love, that we would be Jesus' hands and his feet in this time. So as we sing this song together, let's think upon uh, what's going on and how to best respond, but let's surrender all of this to our Lord for um, in many ways we are weak and there's nothing we can offer. Truly, only God can do a work um, to bring justice, to bring revival, to bring change in this world, in our hearts. So let's respond in that way through these songs. Brothers, let us come together Walking in the Spirit, there's much to be done. We will come reaching out from our comforts, and they will know us by our love. Sisters, we were made for kindness. We can pierce the darkness as He shines through us. We will come reaching with a song of healing. And they will know us by our love. The time is now. Come church Love with His hands, see with His eyes, binds it around you, let it never leave you. And they will know us by our love. Some children. Children, you are hope for justice. Stand firm in the truth now. Set your hearts above. You will be reaching long after we're gone. And they will know us by our love. Sing that again, children. Children, you are hope for justice. Stand firm in the truth now. Set your hearts above. You will be reaching long after we're gone. And they will know you by your love. The time is now. The time is now. Come church arise. Love with his hands. See with his eyes. Bind it around you. Let it never leave you. And they will know us by our the time is now. The time is now. Come church us. Love with his hands. See with his eyes. Bind it around you. Let it never leave you. And they will know us by our love. Bind it. Bind it around you, let it never leave you. And they will know us by our love. Lord, we thank you that you are a God that uh, is for justice and perfect justice. And you demonstrated that by sending your Son 
to die upon the cross. Lord, you can't just let these sins go as a God that is just. And so you had to pour upon your wrath for this injustice upon your son. So we are grateful for that. Lord, we even see in our own hearts as we think through the things that are going on today, whether or not there's even racism within our hearts, and we come to you in repentance. We come to you as a church in repentance as well, as we see that in many ways we fall short, in many ways we are flawed, but we are thankful that you are a perfect God that ministers perfect love, perfect grace, and perfect justice. And Lord, we look to the cross and see all these as true, and we find hope in that. And we find that you are in control, God, sovereign over all things. And that gives us, uh, us hope as well. So we lay these things at your feet in Christ's name. Let's continue to worship our God. Sovereign on the mountain air, sovereign on the ocean floor, with me in the calm, with me in the storm. Sovereign in my greatest joy, sovereign in my deepest cry, with me in the dark, with me at the dawn. In your everlasting arms All the pieces of my life From beginning to the end I can trust you In your never-failing love You work everything for good God, whatever comes my way I will trust you Sing again, Sovereign. Sovereign in the mountain air, Sovereign on the ocean floor, With me in the calm, With me in the storm, Sovereign in my greatest joy, Sovereign in my deepest cry, With me in the dark, With me at the dawn, in your everlasting arms All the pieces of my life From beginning to the end I can trust you In your never-failing love You work everything for good God, whatever comes my way I will trust you God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. It's all my hopes, all I need, it's held in your hands. All my life, all of me, it's held in your hands. It's all my fears, all my dreams, it's held in your hands. All my hopes, it's all my hopes, all I need, it's held in your hands, it's all my life, all of me, it's held in your hands, all my fears, all my dreams, it's held in your hands, you're everlasting. In your everlasting arms All the pieces of my life From beginning to the end I can trust you In your never failing love You work everything for good God, whatever comes my way I will trust you In your everlasting arms in your everlasting arms 
all the pieces of my life from beginning to the end I can trust you and you'll never fail in love you work everything for good God whatever comes my way I will trust you God whatever comes my way I will trust you God whatever comes my way I will trust you That is our confession, that is our prayer, that is our praise, that we will trust him. So let's take a seat. And when we first see who God is, then we get to see who we are, imperfect, sinful, and desperately in need of God. So let us turn to God in our confession time. The corporate confession of sin comes from James 5, verse 12. Allow me to read that for us. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Now let us confess this corporate prayer of sin together. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We do not speak truthfully with one another, but we constantly spin, minimize, or excuse our sin while we inflate, exalt, and call attention to our selfishly motivated good works. We neglect your life-giving word ourselves, and we weaponize your truth in order to accuse and control others. Jesus, thank you for living a life of genuine integrity, lovingly confronting spiritual nodals and comforting the spiritually downcast. You spoke truth with grace and gentleness, not to tear down, but to bind up. And you pointed lie-captured hearts back to the reality of your Father's loving care. Grant us your character that our words will hold weight in a world where integrity is overlooked, also that your name would be praised by all. Amen. Now let us spend some time coming to God in repentance. This is where we rightly turn our eyes and our fingers from anyone else, anything else, but to humbly and clearly see ourselves. Where have we sinned? How have we participated in injustice? How have we been such active and avid participator of sin? Let us use this time to personally approach God with humility and in repentance. Let's pray. And as we turn to God in repentance, God shows us the assurance of the way, the way to life that is provided in nowhere else, the truth and the life that no one else is able to provide. We are presented with our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we get to see how he is the true judge, how he saves us from the reign of sin and for us to live to righteousness. That is what 1 Peter 2 gives us this morning. Hear this assurance of the gospel pardon. For to this you have been called, 
because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. With that, let us rise and affirm our faith together. For this month, we are going to affirm our faith through the Lord's Prayer. Let's affirm this in one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue in worship. before creation eternity in your hand cause you spoke the earth into motion my soul now to stand You stood before my failures and carried the cross for my shame. I weighed and upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So, what can I say? So what can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I'll walk upon. So I walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me, it's life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. Sing that again, so I walk upon. So I walk upon salvation, the Spirit alive in me, this life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? So what can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So what can I say? So what can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to
Austin, y'all stand. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned. Did all of the one who gave it all. And I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am. Is your I stand So I stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all So I stand my soul Lord to you surrendered all I am is your and all I am is yours. So what could I say? What could I do? But offer this heart, oh God. Lord, we thank you that we can stand before the living and awesome, amazing God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the ruler of all things, that is sovereign and in control of every circumstance and situation in our lives. And though things on this earth seem chaotic and perfect, sometimes a complete and utter disaster, we look to a God that is working something beautiful, even out of this mess. And we are so grateful that we serve a king that loves his creation, loves his people, loves mercy, and loves justice. So we come standing in confidence, knowing that in the midst of all that is going on today, that you are working, that you are good, that you are in control. So we find hope in you. We find our hope and rest in your word, in your truths. Lord, we just ask that you will continue to do that work in our church, that in these times the church would respond properly, the church would respond as Jesus responded to the sin of injustice. In all things, Lord God, we look to you. Give us strength today as we worship you. In Christ's name we pray. You may take your seats. Now let's enter a time of renewal. Let us first do so through the time of offering. And as we remind ourselves of how we could do that by either online e-giving or mailing checks, let's spend some time right now to pray for the offering. Let's turn to God uh, to rightly recognize his ownership and giving thanks to him. And let's pray for the usage of this offering for his kingdom. So let's spend this time to pray for these things. Let's pray. For today's prayer for the nations, we will be praying for our very own country. It is truly a hard time in our country. Perhaps it is difficult for us to not feel the uh, weight of what we see and hear on a daily basis as our nation continues to struggle with the latest instances of injustice. The whole nation is getting together to mourn the tragic deaths and murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and countless others, and we're grieving, we're angry, and we're crying out for God's justice to intervene. So let us rightly respond in prayer. Let's pray. First, let us grieve. As we rightly understand how every human being is made in God's own image, when we see such tragedy, we mourn, 
that an image of God has been extinguished from this world. And let's grieve over the evils of racism systemically embedded in our country, our church, our society, our own hearts. And let's pray for the families of the victims. Let's pray for those who have been victimized by such oppression and injustice. Let us also repent individually as well as corporately as a church. It has always been Jesus' teaching all along for us to actively strive for human equality as he did so during his ministry. So let us repent of the ways that we have not kept in line with the gospel message of unity and reconciliation. Can we also pray for comfort and healing for the African American community and for the peace and protection of peaceful protest, uh, protesters as well as for law enforcement to serve and protect its people, its cities, and for justice to show through necessary re reforms for lasting change in our societies. Let's pray for both the victims and enemies that the gospel of Christ will be a message of forgiveness and redemption to all who draw near. Let us pray for our readiness to listen, a genuine humility to understand that we can't possess the knowledge of everything, but we need God for our humble heart to depend on him and his guidance uh, to understand and hear, be ready to hear even the opinions that may differ from others. And lastly, not least, let's pray for our actions. Let us consider how the Holy Spirit might be urging us to act in the name of Jesus within our own spheres of influence. It might be our friends, it might be our families, or our neighborhoods. It may look differently for everyone. Let us pray to allow the Lord to be the voice that guides us in this regard. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we come to you with a heart of mourning because we see injustice. We see heart aching evil still too close. Uh, we rightly enrage and fall into anguish as we see your precious creation being attacked by evil. God, we ask for your mercy. God, we ask for your intervention. But we thank you for allowing us to come to you in prayer we ask that all of this will be guided by your Holy Spirit and that we will get to solely depend on you in this time. God, we repent. <sighs> I have to take these atrocities to call our attention to our ignoring of such injustice that still prevailed in our country, in the world. Forgive us for participating in the sins of racism when we sinned by seeing people differently, valuing people differently, treating people differently. Forgive us, Lord. God, we pray for those who are hurting, especially the families of the victims. Would you come near them? Console their broken hearts, Lord. Would you let them not lose heart? We pray for the African-American community. Lord, heal them by your son's blood. Protect them and deliver them from evil. Please be near to the protesters. Also be with the law enforcement. God, we ask that you would reform the culture, that we do not ever condone such evil. Lord Jesus, reign in us. And God, we ask for you to guide us from this point on. Let us not stop at a mere grief. Let us not feel sufficient at this moment. Let us sit heavily in our hearts that we would continue this prayer, this journey to reform the culture of our society by the gospel of Christ. Let it reform our hearts, Lord. Let us diligently seek your guidance in changing our community, our homes, our own hearts to see Jesus, see as Jesus sees, and transform this world in your name. God, we confess that only an ultimate solution comes from you. That is our confession. And Lord, we are blessed to know that you start with us. So Lord, let us turn to you. Speak to us every day 
every moment. Let us passionately hear your voice as we seek for the guidance from this point on. Let us not rest in seeking for justice in America. Let us continue be to, to be attentive to the cries of the people all over the world. God, convict us daily so that we may take real steps daily. Let us come nearer to you as you kindly have been doing so. We ask you that we will be able to continue our battle against everything in life today, the injustice, the pandemic, loneliness, turmoils in life. God, it's filled with difficulties, but would you be kind to us? Let us walk with you, faithfully holding on to you. Give us joy, Lord. Give us hope. Let us let the hope of the gospel prevail in our lives. We thank you and we praise you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Once again, my name is David Kim. I'm one of the pastoral staffs in Renewal Mainline. And here are some of our announcements. If you're new to Renewal, we're very glad that you're, you can worship with us. Please take the opportunity to tell us about yourself so we could contact you to tell you more about our church. Visit our website and find more about us, Lord. And we have new Renewal Fellowship Fun and Fellowship events in June. Please check out the events we have on our website. It'll be the green button on the right uh, side of our website. And especially for the book club, please know that each meeting is broken into chapters so you can join the discussion on any date. Please uh, save this time for a congregational prayer meeting in two weeks. That is June 21st. We'll do it at 12.15 to 12.45 p.m. Join us for, uh, as we come together and pray together for everything we can. May I ask us to please continue to pray for our brother and our elder Jo Hyun as he continues his battle, his journey of battling leukemia. Please keep him in your prayer at utmost fashion. Um, let us be diligent and let us be um, vigil in seeking for the Holy Spirit and in his comfort and his strengthening as we come together in this battle together. And as always, uh, if you're facing any spiritual, emotional, and, or financial, or any, any needs, please do not hesitate to contact us at our email. And um, the contributions for our COVID-19 fund can be mailed to the church or through our church website's e-giving options. With that, let us now turn to our passage this morning. It's John chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. Once again, the passage is John 1, 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Good morning. My name is Bill Smith. I'm also one of the pastors here at Renewal Mainline. We're continuing our series this morning in the book of John, and it's a series where we are studying how Jesus engages people by altering his approach to them, by tailoring the way that he interacts with each one of them so that he can meet the needs of the unique individual who's standing in front of him. And as he does that, we get to see a different aspect of him, a different side of him. We start to understand him a little bit more and we start to have greater reasons to trust him. We also get a better idea of how to communicate him to the people around us. 
Now this week we are picking up where we left off last week. Several people have already come to Jesus. A couple of John the Baptist's disciples, uh, Simon, who's now known as Simon Peter, they all just met Jesus. They're beginning to realize there's something really special about him. He's much more than any teacher or a Messiah. He's someone who renames people and believes that he actually can make that name stick, that he can give a new identity. And he's telling the people around him, and he's telling us as we listen in, that there's something about him that goes way beyond any mere mortal. Today he's going to make that case even more strongly, but he's going to do it today with someone that you might be inclined to walk away from. He's going to do it with someone who has a bias against other people, someone who feels superior to other people, someone that you and I might call a racist. And as you watch Jesus' interaction today, you learn a lot about racism, you learn a lot about God's response to it. Now, we planned this passage for today several months ago, but it should not surprise any of us that the, today's passage is about racism and about God's response to us. It shouldn't surprise us because from one perspective, the entire Bible is about racism and God's response to it. Now, if you don't see that, it's because you have the wrong idea of what the Bible is about. You're not alone. You don't have to feel bad. Many people have an idea that when they come to the scripture, what are they doing? They're approaching the Bible like it's an encyclopedia. An encyclopedia that talks about certain problems and then gives certain answers, solutions. So if they're struggling in their marriage, they go looking for the, through the Bible for marriage passages. Or if they need help raising their children, they go looking through the Bible for parenting passages. Or they'll search for business practice passages or finance passages or sexuality passages or some kind of peaceful, tranquil passages. Now, are there passages that address those topics more directly than others? Well, of, of course there are. But scripture is not trying to give you advice in little isolated packets that it's spread throughout all of those pages so that you have to sort of go play hide and seek, gather them all up, glue them together, and then stick them onto your life. That gives you a very thin Bible then because there's just not a lot that it says in any one of those areas. That's not what scripture is doing. Scripture is giving you a whole new way to see your entire life. It's telling you that you have a new identity that you have a new relationship with God and that results in a new life and its goal is to help you navigate this new approach to life in every area of your life. In that sense, it's not trying to give you a couple action steps that you sweep together glue and, and, and glue together and then attach to the way that you've normally been doing your, your life. If you do that, you're going to discover those new steps will not work the way that you think they should. What scripture is doing instead is it's reorienting all of you, reorienting how you approach life, giving you a completely new approach to life. It's reshaping how you think. It's reshaping what you feel. It's reshaping what grabs your attention. It's reshaping what you do about it. In that sense, all of scripture, all the time, is about all of the things that I already talked about, and it's about all the things that I didn't talk about. Therefore, it's legitimate to ask when you're reading a passage, what does this passage say about whatever that topic is that you're interested in? What does it have to say to me as a parent? What does it have to say to me as a spouse? What does it have to say to me as a child? What does it have to say about me as an employer, as an employee, or more pointedly today, what does it have to say about racism, about the causes of racism, its effects, God's thoughts on it, his approach, his solution? And when you start to understand that's what Scripture is doing, suddenly it says a lot about everything in your life. You have a much bigger Bible at that point because everything from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 has something to say to what you're wrestling with in your own life. For instance, in Genesis 1, what do you learn? You learn that we are descended from the same human pair, that there is one human race, yes, composed of many different ethnicities, but no ethnicity can claim to be morally superior to any other because we all come from the same ancestors. Our fundamental equality as people is grounded in the creator created order, as is our concern that justice is equally given to everybody made in the image of God. Take Genesis 1 away, and you no longer have a reason for claiming equality. Or flip over to the end, into Revelation. You learn that our destiny is to join God and his people in a huge city that is packed with people from every tribe, every language, every nation on the earth. 
Our destiny is far from dull, it's far from monocultural. Instead, our future utopia is teeming with diversity. Every passage in scripture has something to say to the question of how this one race expresses itself in multiple ethnicities, multiple cultures. And it has something to say with, about how sin has broken and twisted that diversity. All of scripture is about the beauty of what God made in our diversity, the ugliness of how it's been twisted, the goodness of God, not to abandon us in it, not to leave us in sadness, but to come and to restore what he made. Today's passage is no exception. What is it then that tunes our minds to this issue today and not to any of the other issues that we could come to, come with to this passage? Well, clearly it's what's taking place in our larger world right now, the injustice that's been directed against the African-American community. We see that in our society. We see the response to it and we wonder, what do we do with these things? How do we think about them? How do we respond? This is part of how culture intersects with scripture. Each society, each culture alerts you to certain things at different points in time and it alerts you to those more strongly than it alerts you to other things. Your cultural location zeroes in on certain values and it makes you aware of their importance. So when you come to scripture, you're already coming primed. You can't help it. You come primed to look for those things. It's helpful. I'd argue it's necessary if you actually want to understand the mind and the heart of God. But it also means that you have to be careful. Because at the same time that your social setting drives you to come and ask, what does God think about X, Y, and Z? It also primes you to expect to hear certain answers. It can help you ask God very important questions. It can also get in the way of hearing his answer because you're listening for something that agrees with what you already think. You have to bring these questions, these concerns to scripture. You have to ask God, what's your take on this? but you also have to be ready for him to respond in a way that you didn't expect. He may agree with some of your concerns. He may agree with all of your concerns, but he also might disagree. You have to ask yourself, am I ready to come to scripture with the openness that says God may disagree with me and what I expect to hear? Or maybe, and I think this is probably more often and and much harder, he'll say something that makes you think more deeply and more broadly, he neither fully agrees nor he fully disagrees. The society that he's placed you in provokes you to ask certain questions. He's intended that. That's why he's placed you in this society. But you need to be ready for him to respond in ways that you don't expect. Why? Because the society needs to hear from him. How's it going to hear from him? It's going to hear through you as you engage with him and then communicate to the larger society. See, this is what scripture does. You bring a question to God. God responds, and his response changes how you think. It changes how you approach the question. It changes the questions that you're asking. He doesn't dismiss your question. He doesn't invalidate it. He gives you a bigger framework within which to understand it. And in responding then to what you care about, he shows actually he cares a whole lot more than you do. And in caring a whole lot more, he enters into your world reworking your heart, changing you, so that you learn to care about it even more than you did before. You have to expect him not to fully agree with you, not to fully agree with the words that you use or the concepts that you think are crucial. You have to think of it like a relationship. You have to expect that you and he are not always going to be on the same page and that he very well might disagree with you. What does that mean? It means you have to spend time with him asking these questions. You have to spend time listening to what he has to say. You have to take what you're hearing in the news, on your Twitter feed, in your Instagram stories. You have to take what you're hearing in the world that he has put you in. You have to take what you're reading, what you're studying, and you have to bring it back to him and ask, what do you think about these things? That's what we're trying to do today. Now, little caveat up front, Not everything that we care about right now is going to be found in this passage. In fact, most of it will not be. If you want to have everything that you care about understood, you have to have the whole counsel of God. How do you get the whole counsel of God? You learn that over a lifetime. We're not trying to do that this morning. We're not trying to develop an exhaustive theology of racism. What are we going to do? We're going to look at one instance 
of where Jesus entered into it voluntarily. And we're asking the question, what do we learn here that will help us as we enter into the complexity of our modern world? You look at today's passage, tuned in with everything that's been going on in our world, and there's no way to miss Nathaniel's question. There's no way that you cannot be offended by Nathaniel's question. Leaps out of the passage at you. It demands your attention. Verse 46, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, a little background here. Nathaniel's friend Philip just came to him and said, verse 45, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. That's an amazing statement. Philip has just said, Nathaniel, he's here. The Messiah, this one that the whole Hebrew scriptures points to, that's what he means when he says Moses in the law and the prophets, it's a shorthand for the whole scripture that we have. Nathaniel, the one that God told us about, is here right now. We found him. Not I found him, we found him. There's a bunch of us who are completely convinced. This is the one that God started telling us about back in the Garden of Eden, the one who is going to come to crush Satan's head. He's here in our lifetimes right now. It's an astonishing statement that this one who's been prophesied about for thousands of years is walking on earth right now. And instead of being excited or even skeptical, seriously, in our lifetime, Nathaniel has a different response. His response is, from Nazareth. Sure. That place, can anything good come out of there? He doesn't dismiss Philip's claims on the merits of Philip's research doesn't dismiss Philip's understanding of Scripture, doesn't even dismiss Philip's claims on the merits of his discernment. Nathaniel, it's this Messiah, not that Messiah. Nathaniel dismisses Philip's claims on the basis of Jesus' origins, of where he came from, on the basis of his background, on the basis of the people he grew up with, on the basis of his people. Now notice that there's a category error here. Nathaniel's making a moral distinction. He's saying something is good or something is bad. But he's making that distinction not according to what someone has done, but according to where they were raised, according to their people group. Now, why is that a category error? Because morality has to do with what? It has to do with how someone lives before the face of God. That is either good or bad. Morality has nothing to do with where you live, where you grow up, or the people that you're related to. How do you think about where you grew up? Well, where you grew up gives you greater or fewer advantages. It sets you back in life or it propels you forward. It makes you more or less privileged. It doesn't make you more or less good. Your ancestry and your background are not moral. You're not responsible for where you were born or raised or your ethnicity. That was solely dependent on God. That's what he thought needed to happen in order to bless the world with his image, with you. Nathaniel, however, attaches a moral assessment to Nazareth. There's nothing good that comes from there. That the disadvantages inherent in growing up in Nazareth, among the Nazarenes, in Nathaniel's mind, means that a person is unable to aid or benefit their society. Nothing good comes from there. Because they're related to that pe place and to those people, they themselves are what they themselves are not good. They have less to offer than someone who is related to other people and places. And you just start to think about all of the assumptions that Nathaniel is making with that one little sentence. How he's assuming that an individual's worth and value is measured by what they do or do not produce. That's an assumption. That an individual can be measured by their societal affiliations. That he, Nathaniel, has the right to do the measuring and that he's morally superior to anyone coming from Nazareth. So much happening in that one little sentence that dismisses another human being, one made in the image of God. Something where he says they're not as valuable, they're not as worthwhile as someone else. You think, man, what, what's going on? Let's, let's see if we get inside his head a little bit. What's wrong with Nazareth? You know, there's not a lot that we learn about Nazareth. You learn that it's a small village, it's hard at this point, we're 2,000 years later, it's hard to get an exact estimate. The guesses are that it was somewhere between a couple hundred, 2,000 people. Tiny. It's off the beaten path. 
not adjacent to a big city, not a cultural center, most likely poor, rural. Jesus does not come from wealth, power, privilege. He came from the wrong section of town, if you want to say it that way. He came from the wrong town. And Jesus didn't try to cover it up. Instead, he was known that way. No one ever linked him to where he was born. No one ever called him Jesus the Bethlehemite. That would have linked him to what? To royalty, the one who was born in the city of David would give him a little boost in his status. Instead, Jesus was very happy to be known as the Nazarene, the one who came from a poor, disadvantaged community up there in the backwater of Galilee somewhere. And because that was his background and those were his people, Nathaniel dismisses him, doesn't think much of him, despite never having met him. It's pretty ugly. It's actually worse the longer you study the book of John. John tells us in chapter 21, verse 2, that Nathanael came from Cana. Nazareth was in Galilee. Cana was about five to eight miles north of Nazareth. Apparently, there's some rivalry between Nazareth and Cana. Some prejudice that those in Cana look down on those from Nazareth. What's odd is that Cana is not all that different. Also small, also not well off. If you read chapter 2 in the book of John, you come across Jesus' first miracle. He turned water into wine at a wedding party, where? In Cana. You think, well, why did he do that? Well, because the couple didn't have the funds to celebrate properly. They're about to be shamed in the eyes of their community. Jesus wants something better for them. And in that moment, you start to get a glimpse that Cana was not a wealthy village. Also rural, not urbane. Coming from there did not give you any more social advantages than coming from Nazareth. But Nathaniel doesn't see it that way. He sees his people as superior to those from Nazareth. Now, what did you just learn? You just learned that racism doesn't need big differences. Yes, you can see it take place on an international scale. The prophet Jonah hated the Assyrians so much that he would rather disobey God than warn them that God was going to judge them. He didn't want them to repent. He didn't want them to receive God's mercy. He wanted them, what? Gone, destroyed, removed from the face of the earth. Racism can be international. Or it can be regional. Nation of Israel had an ethnic group, the Samaritans, right in the middle of the nation. Judea was down to the south, Galilee was to the north, and in the middle was Samaria. And the Israelites hated the Samaritans so badly that if they had to travel between Galilee and Judea, they often took a long way around just to avoid going through the area. Racism was nothing new in the ancient world. But Nathaniel takes you even deeper. He shows you the essence of racism. Two villages, less than 10 miles apart, both of the same ethnicity, both of the same socioeconomic status, but a man from one feels superior to a man from another even though he's never met him personally. Nathaniel shows you that the root of racism is where? It's, it's in the human heart. That it springs from this yearning to think that you're better than someone else, that your people are better than their people. That root expresses itself in a lot of different ways, ways that are not all equal, obviously, but ways that do come from the same source. A root that says, can anything good come from there? And the answer, obviously, is, No, not in his assessment. And because nothing good can come from there, I can dismiss you. I can mistreat you. I can feel justified in doing that. Now notice what Philip does with this. And notice how Nathaniel responds. Philip does not tackle the issue head on. Probably not a surprise to him that his friend thinks like this. There's obviously no way to know. But he doesn't act surprised. He doesn't say, what? What, what, what do you mean? Don't you know that's racist? Doesn't argue with him. Instead, he invites him to come and experience something that Nathaniel has not yet experienced. He invites him to get to know this person. He invites Nathaniel to put your prejudice aside just long enough to interact, to engage with an individual, someone from the Nazareth community. It's the same invitation that Jesus gave from last week. Come and see. Come and get to know Jesus as a person. And Nathaniel does something here that's the first sign of hope in this passage. It's the first step of addressing his superiority sin. It's the first step of repentance. He decides to get to know someone that he previously dismissed. He overcomes his prejudice just a little 
to go meet this man from the Nazareth community. And what he experiences there turns everything upside down, turns it all on its head. Jesus greets him, verse 47, and he greets him by saying, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit, in whom there is nothing false. Now this is the only time that John uses the word Israelite in his book, so there's something here that's significant. What is Jesus doing? He's resetting the categories. Nathaniel wants to make it Cana versus Nazareth. Jesus doesn't say, well, those differences don't matter. What he says is, there's another category that's even more fundamental to your identity, more foundational to your identity. You are an Israelite. You're part of the people of God. And I'm an Israelite. Can we start the discussion at that level? He's just given to Nathaniel what Nathaniel refused to give to him. He's given him the dignity of recognizing that Nathaniel's been made in the image of God and that he's part of the people of God. In one sentence, he reframes all the terms of the discussion. But then he adds, by the way, I know you. Sorry about that. By the way, I know you. You're coming to check me out, to educate yourself about me, to learn about me. But I already know you. You're an Israelite in whom there's nothing false. And there's something about that revelation that rings so true to Nathaniel that he doesn't say, what are you talking about? You don't know the first thing about me. We just met. Instead, he's dumbfounded. He asks, verse 48, how do you know me? Not, how do you know about my people, but how do you know me? Because obviously Jesus knows him personally, not just as someone connected to the Cana community. Yes, that community has shaped who Nathaniel is and how he looks out on the world, but Jesus knows he's more than that. He also has a unique, ind he's also a unique individual that Jesus has spent time getting to know. And he lets Nathaniel know how he knows him. He says, verse 48, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Jesus, in that moment, just gives this man a glimpse of something that nobody has seen yet. Andrew, Simon, Peter, Philip, each of them got something from Jesus that they needed in order to believe, but they didn't get this. They didn't get this kind of miraculous intervention into their lives. Don't miss this. Jesus takes this special moment of prophetic insight of miraculous sight and he uses it for someone who wanted to label him and dismiss him nathaniel's blown away he blurts out rabbi you are the son of god you're the king of israel now based on his reaction nathaniel was apparently doing something under a fig tree somewhere that was really important you have no idea what that was you don't need to know what's important obviously is that jesus knew now since Nathaniel's an Israelite in whom there's nothing false, we can assume that he wasn't doing something shady there. But also based on his response, he didn't think anybody else knew anything about it. And yet here's this guy, Jesus, who says, I have known you. I've studied you. I've educated myself about you. I know what you were doing, and I know your motivation behind it, that it was something good. Nathaniel doesn't think anything good can come out of Israel. Uh, out of Nazareth. Jesus just told him, I see something good in you. And in that moment, Nathaniel repents further. He says, I thought I was superior to you. What I've just discovered is that you are way out of my league. You are the king of Israel. Don't get caught up there on son of God. That's another way of saying king of Israel. If you want to understand more of that, feel free, email me. We can unpack that together. He says, you're the king of Israel which means what? You're my king because I'm an Israelite. You are superior to me. Now, is that the last time that Nathaniel's going to struggle with being racist? If I know anything about the human heart, probably not. But he's learned to see the world differently than how he had earlier. He's no longer seeing Jesus through the lens of the stereotypes that he grew up with. He realizes there is more to Jesus than he ever thought possible. Now, I need you to be very careful here because Jesus is not showing oppressed people, those who are the victims of racism, how to deal with racists. 
He's not an example to you of someone from a disenfranchised community rising above their background to reach out and give even more. It's not what he's showing you. He's showing instead how God deals with the moral inferiority that our sin brings. See, God is the morally superior one in every way imaginable. Jesus is the one of privilege in this encounter. Nathaniel has no idea, but Jesus comes from a far better background, comes from far better people than you can begin to imagine, and Jesus does not sneer. He doesn't say, Earth. Can anything good come from there? Instead of dismissing us, he joins us. He becomes one of us. He enters into our world, bringing good into it, bringing his privilege into it, bringing heaven into it. That's what he means when he says, verse 51, truly, truly, I say to you, you'll see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, that's a reference back to Genesis 28. Jacob, at that time, was running away from his family because his brother Esau wanted to kill him. Jacob had tricked him twice, a lot of deceit in Jacob, a lot of falseness. And while on the run, Jacob had a dream one night. He saw angels ascending and descending a ladder, a ladder that linked heaven and earth. And while that was happening, the Lord appeared to him and promised that he would continue to restore the world through Jacob, and that God would not leave Jacob until he did what he had promised. Jacob wakes up and he says, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. This is the place that links heaven and earth. I had no idea. Here comes Jesus about 2,000 years later, and he says, you will see angels ascending and descending where? On me. I am the link between heaven and earth. I'm the one who brings heaven down to this earth, who brings good into your world. I'm the house of God. For Nathaniel, that meant Jesus entered into this moment clouded by sin, Nathaniel's sense of superiority that had gotten built into the fabric of his life. Jesus entered into that not to get good from Nathaniel, but to bring good to him. It's exactly what he did for Nazareth. Jesus didn't originally come from Nazareth. He came from heaven. He came from heaven with all the advantages that heaven had over Nazareth. And he came from heaven to Nazareth to bring the people there, what? The advantages that he already had. The privilege that he already had. See, Jesus is the privileged one. He's the advantaged one who does not use the community to make himself better off. He doesn't use the community to make himself feel superior, to advantage himself. Instead, he disadvantages himself for the sake of advantaging the community, for the sake of lifting the community up. Jesus makes his life worse than it has to be in order to make the life of the community better than it was to make the lives of individuals within that community better than they were, to make your life better. And then he invites you, after bringing good into your world, to take whatever advantages you now have from him and use them in exactly the same way to benefit the community around you, whatever that community is. Now, how are you going to do that? Four ways, very quickly. You're going to do that sacrificially, indiscriminately, quietly, and persistently. Sacrificially, indiscriminately, quietly, and persistently. First, sacrificially. If you want to use your advantages like Jesus uses his, you have to ask a different question as you approach people. Not Nathaniel's question of, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Is there anything good in this encounter for me? Not Nathaniel's question. But the opposite one that Jesus asked, what good can I bring into Nazareth? What good can I bring into someone's life from my own advantages? Jesus grew up in Nazareth, this poor little rural community. And because he grew up there, it became the home of the house of God, the home for Jesus, the home for the link between heaven and earth. Jesus didn't go there to live for what he could get from them, 
but to help them see that God cares for those who in the world's eyes are most despised. He lived there, not looking for something from them, but in order to bring heaven to them. Did the same thing for Nathaniel. He helped him see that despite his arrogance, God did not treat him the way that he deserved to be treated, the way that he, the way that Nathaniel was treating other people. Jesus does not dismiss Nathaniel like Nathaniel dismissed Jesus. Instead, he brought heaven to Nathaniel in such a way that it touched the man at his core. So that effectively, Nathaniel said, this is so much better than anything I ever imagined it could be. I want more of this. Please be my king. So if the Nathaniels in your life need respect and dignity, when they offer none, give it to them. You have plenty left from Christ, who respects and dignifies you with his presence. If the Nazareths in your life need the advantages that God's given to you, then give to them, even though they can't repay you. For your sake, Christ became poor so that you might become rich. You're never going to say to him at some point, you know what, you, I think you owe me because I think I gave more than you actually gave to me. Give out of the abundance that Christ has given you. That's number one. If you want to use your advantages like Jesus uses his, you have to do so sacrificially. Second, you have to do so indiscriminately. You start watching Jesus live his life, and you realize that he responds to every single person who steps into his world, including those who are oppressed, because he very much cares about justice, but he also engages those who do the oppressing. He doesn't interact with them all in the same way, but he interacts with each one of them. Nazareth or Nathaniel doesn't matter. Jesus interacts with them both. He doesn't prejudge who is worthy of his time and of his energy. Who should he offer to help? He trusts instead that if this person is standing in front of him, then somehow this is what God has for him, how, what the Father has for him. And therefore, Jesus enters into that as part of what it means for him to link heaven and earth. If you want to use your advantages like Jesus uses his, you have to do so indiscriminately. You have to do so sacrificially. You have to do so indiscriminately. And you have to do so quietly. Let me unpack what I mean by quietly. Jesus grew up in Nazareth about 30 years of his life. 30 years of his life that you know almost nothing about. You get a summary of those first three decades in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Luke tells you, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That's it. He grew in favor with God and man, with God and human beings. You have no idea what he did to bring heaven to earth there. But whatever it was, people thought highly of it. He grew in favor with the people around him. And yet you know so little of what he's doing. What's that tell you? He didn't do it so that it would be known. He didn't do it so that he would get recognition from it. Instead, he lived out in those years what he later taught in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. On the sermon, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you'll have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Don't do your acts of righteousness just for the sake of being seen. That's really hard to do. It is so hard to live sacrificially, and I want one other person to know about that. To do something that is good and right, but to do it not because it's good and right, but because you want someone else to see it so that what? So that they think that you are good and right. So that you get some credit for it. It's especially hard to resist right now. It's so easy to virtue signal to communicate that your social conscience is working appropriately, that you are on the right side of history. And so you want to reference things that you've done or studied or learned, to post things so that other people will see, yes, you're really okay. There are times when what you do, your acts of righteousness, have to be seen for the sake of change. They have to be public, like coming together in visible solidarity against evil. There are times when what you do has to be visible. But that's very different from doing that public thing in order to get credit for having done that public thing. If you want to use your advantages like Jesus uses his, most of what you do in this life will be between you, another person, and the Lord. So you need to learn to use your advantages sacrificially, indiscriminately, quietly, and lastly, persistently. Jesus spent his entire life doing what? Bringing good into this world. 
Watch him over his lifetime. You see him constantly pouring himself out for whoever's in front of him. That's why it's not strange for him to give to Nathaniel. It's not an unusual thing for him to meet someone where they're at and to give them what they need so that what? So they can get a little closer to God. That was his fundamental approach to life. It was something that he practiced consistently. Now that moment with Nathaniel called for something special from him, but in one sense that moment was just normal. It wasn't a special thing because that was the way Jesus lived his life. If you want to advantage others, you have to learn to think in terms of a marathon, not a sprint. You have to practice extending yourself each day in whatever way is needed to the people around you. You have to practice on a daily basis setting aside what you would like to give to somebody else what they need. You start with those who are closest to you and you ask yourself, how can I take the advantages that I have today and how can I use those for good for someone else? How can I take those and bring good to my child? How can I take the advantages I have and bring good to my spouse, bring good to my roommate? You branch out from there. How can I bring good today to the people that I work with, to the people in my neighborhood, to the people in my region, to people who are like me, to people who are not like me? How can I bring good to those who suffer injustice? You start to realize what, it's a continuum, right? You can't do the hard end if you're not doing the other end. You don't want this to be a time where you are energized for a little while over issues of racism and injustice, and then later have those issues just drop off your radar. That means you have to develop a lifelong trajectory where daily you are disadvantaging yourself more and more and more in order to advantage others. Now, in closing, is this the final word on racism, on superiority, on using your privilege? Well, hardly because Jesus already had the final word. He told Nathaniel and all who were standing there that day that they would see greater things than him telling someone, I saw you under a fig tree. That they would see heaven open, they would see the angels of God ascending and descending on himself. But then this Jesus, this ladder, this one who came to bring heaven to earth, this Jesus would hang on a cross suspended between heaven and earth. That was the greater thing. What was he doing there? According to Ephesians chapter 2, this was how he got rid of the hostility that's between people. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace, who's made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Jesus hung there between heaven and earth. For every time that you've sneered at someone because they didn't look like you, they didn't sound like you, for every time that they didn't come from where you came from and you sneered, or you sneered because they didn't act like you act, or you sneered because they don't have the values that you have or, the thought, or think the thoughts that you have, See, Jesus would still be the link between heaven and earth, the way for you to be with God. But the latter had to become a cross. And the one who never misused his privilege hung there so that he could say, at last, it's finished. That was the last word on racism. That hostility has been put to death, that your sins are paid for, that you do not need to feel heavy and you don't need to wallow in them today. The wall is broken down. It's broken down for Nathaniel. It's broken down for you. The two people who were opposed to each other can now be brought together. They can now be one. That was the final word. Racism doesn't have the final word. Situation is not hopeless. Res reconciliation does have the final word. Why? Because the privileged one, the most privileged one in the universe, laid down his privilege for you. Our words, our actions of today are what? We're just trying to catch up a little bit closer to where his final word already is. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you did not leave us lost in our sin, 
Lord, you're very aware, well aware of it. It did not surprise you. It's why you came to this earth, but you came to free us from that, that we might not simply have a relationship with you, which sounds really belittling to say simply, but you did that so that we would then have a relationship with each other. Lord, we are glad today for that. We're glad to be brought into your world and into your kingdom. Lord, let us worship you now with joy. Amen. As we respond to the word, let's remember um, that God desires to make all things new, even in the midst of what we see to bring re reconciliation, as we just heard. And he did that by coming to this earth. Christ came, humbled himself, and he died upon the cross. Let's look to that truth, be reminded of his love for us uh, through that message as we respond. Don't kneel me down again Here at your feet Show me how much you love Humility And so Spirit, be the star that leads me to the humble heart of love. I see. You are the God of the broken. You are the God of the broken, the friend of the weak. Cause you wash the feet of the weary, embrace the ones in I want to be like you, Jesus, and have this heart in me, cause you are the God of the again only on me down only me down again here at your feet show me how much you Jesus, to have this 
to the humble king. Let's run into his arms. Let's worship him. Please receive the benediction from your God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go now in peace. <laughs>